Bourbon Real Talk friends and family, Lindsay Sullivan here with the host of Bourbon Real Talk. That's me, Randy Sullivan. <laughs> Randy Sullivan. Um, we are in the new whiskey room with the new whiskey wall. Wall. So we wanted to do um, a whole episode about all of your collection now that it's in one place. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah. Uh, we talked in the Father's Day episode, um, in case you missed it, about having teenagers in the house and kind of wanting to have any, everything behind locked doors. Mm -hmm. So we're working toward that. Yeah, so we wanted to get the collection all in one location, and we went through a bunch of different design ideas. Originally, I was going to do a bookshelf style, you know, custom, because if y'all don't know, I actually used to build furniture, so I can build anything that's made out of wood. And so then we looked into floating shelves, but that was going to cause a problem because I really was interested in having lighting, and the, the floating shelves would have to be too tall to accommodate the depth of the light, um, plus they're not as stable. And we had done a few things with this, you know, black pipe before, and it was going to be the most efficient, give us the most storage. And so we ended up going with that. Uh, there's a pallet wall behind it, and it creates a false wall. So I ended up screwing two by fours to all of the studs. And then I was able to attach the pallet pieces, which are actually just cedar fence posts or uh, pickets um, that my lovely assistant here stained. I think we ended up with six different variations. Yeah. Um, so we had uh, three different colors and then white whitewashed, whitewashed and half of those. So it produced six different color variations. It was only like 95 degrees in the garage. Yeah, it was only 95 degrees. With like 150% humidity. It only took 40 hours to build the wall. So it was like Super not fun. not even a big deal yeah, at all. Like didn't no, even sweat. Like standing on my head. Actually, I was so sore I couldn't walk for days. <laughs> I am too old for that. Um, but anyway, the false wall gave me space to run some, you know, power for the lights and all of that. Um, and we ended up just building it from the ground up. And so every single shelf has a, a strip of lights. Many of your teenage kids have these same lights in their bedroom. Uh, they will actually allow me to change colors so I can switch to you know blue red green whatever party mode party i can give you a seizure if you're <laughs> interested in that i but, have talked about like putting up like shadows in the window for halloween and then having you know the, the seizure lights yeah going. for sure we'll do something weird for halloween with the whiskey wall why not i did after we finished the whiskey wall turn all the lights on on the shelves turned the lights off in the room, opened up the blinds, walked out in the street to see what people would see when they drove by. And I'm surprised there has not been a car accident yet because... Or break-in. It looks beautiful. <laughs> We've got six different 14 and a half foot long shelves and they are almost full. So there's going to be an expansion um, before too long uh, where we're going to pull it down the sidewalls a little bit, mm. but you know... For now, it will suffice. So that's... And there, there'll be a bar. We're going to build a bar here for when we're doing standing recordings. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a bar situation. Behind the cameras is another wall that we're going to do. Um, a big logo light and a seated arrangement for... So it's a new studio interviews. too. Basically yeah. a new studio. Yeah. Um, and everything is behind a locked door. So... Very exciting. Helpful. Okay, so you said it took you... 40 hours to do it. It did take 40 hours to build. How long did it take you to arrange all of your whiskey? Because this is the first time it's all been in one place. That is it's true. It's all been out. Uh, well, first of all, I will say to the audience, it was shocking to me when I pulled all of the it whiskey out of all of the cabinets and put them all in one place to see all the bottles at once. Um, it was embarrassing. I was just, I'd come in here and I'd just sit and I'd just, I'd just, <laughs> just look at it. I'd just look at it. Um, I, I work from home and now this is my office. I work in here. Yeah. I get up at 545 before the family does and I work until we leave for the gym. And I come in here and turn the whiskey lights on and leave the main lights off and just stare at the collection. I'm not sure how long it took me to arrange the bottles. Um, it was certainly a process because since I'd never been able to put them all in one place before, 
I, I tried a couple of different arrangement models and then I would think that I found something better and then I'd start moving things around. But I did finally settle on an arrangement model. So there is a system. There is. Tell us about the system. So generally speaking, um, and there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, the higher up you go, the more likely that it's a bottle that's expensive or very rare. difficult to replace. Yeah. It's rare. Um, and then as you move down, the bottles become easier to find, kind of like at a liquor store. From left to right, we start off with rise. We transition into Kentucky bourbons, then non-Kentucky bourbons, and then non-bourbons. So if it's scotch, it's on the far right. If it's rum, far right. Yeah. If it's rye, far left. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. So this row right here, the second row, this is an un untouchable section. The undrinkables. The undrinkables. And, and most of these are signed bottles from, you know, master distillers or blenders, whatever. Um, and there's a couple of others that were, you know, special from my family. And then um, there are some instances where, or, or th this entire row is all someone say whiskey club picks. I wanted all the club picks easily together. accessible together. I did try to do it in that order, but there were instances like with uh, Litchfield where we did a rye, but we also did a couple of bourbons, and I didn't want to split the Litchfields up, but technically the Litchfield bourbons should be on the far right-hand side, but I left them together. But that's generally how I have it arranged. Um, but it, it did take me a long time, and it was days of me looking and seeing something that was not in that order, <laughs> and then I have to move all the bottles around and make space to get it where I wanted it to be, so yeah. And, and did you talk to the whiskey while that was happening? You know that you know that I talked to the whiskey. I, I, you know, you learn things about yourself <laughs> as you get older. Non Kentucky, non Kentucky, Kentucky, problem. Isn't that just the club pick shelf? Yeah. But what kind of man would I be? You know? Out of all of this whiskey, by the way, how many bottles of whiskey would you say you have on this wall? Um, we're right around 300. And that's not counting the no. other people's things that we have done. No, here. no, and you ask about the arrangement. So the bottom shelf, for the most part, uh, the far left-hand side are all pickups. So because I run the Someone's Say Whiskey Club, often when we do a barrel drop and somebody's not able to make it, we pick their bottle up for them and then they'll pick it up from my house. We have merch for Someone's Say Whiskey and Bourbon Real Talk and the local people have the option to pick it up at the house. And that's the main reason why I wanted to build a wall because I wanted everyone to be able to see what their options were for pours. Sure. Because when, when we have what we call pick up with pours, people come in here and they can drink from anything except for undrinkable row, and they have to ask permission for anything from the top shelf, but everything sure. else is open. So uh, all the stuff at the bottom left is all for pickups. I've got some stuff in the center at the bottom that's like non-whiskey things, mixers. But still um, things we need to lock up. Yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I love caipirinhas and I have some Brazilian friends that bring me back cachaça from Brazil. So I've got that type of thing down there. And then the far right hand side, I'm always working on a whiskey fundraiser. And so all of that stuff are donations that are earmarked for, you know, fundraisers or things like that. And so when somebody makes a, uh, makes a donation, it comes in, it gets cataloged in whatever tracking system, it goes to the bottom right. We do the fundraiser, it gets awarded to somebody, and then it moves to the bottom left. Those people get notified that they can come pick up their bottle or, you know, if they need shipping or whatever, we figure that stuff out. But that um, whole row can go behind your bar in your expansion. Right, in the expansion, so that, yeah. You know, so no one sees it. You don't have to it. expand yeah. anytime soon. But yeah, but we're gonna expand. And um, 
And it, it, so yeah, there's around 300 bottles. There's probably around 60 bottles that are not on display because they're duplicates. Sure. And we didn't have space, um, you know, especially the stuff that I've worked on personally, like the Prideful Goat and Unallocated. Sure. We keep the extra someplace else. Sorry, Bourbon Real Talk listener. Randy Sullivan coming in for a quick shameless merch plug. If you want to support this channel, you can do so. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. We do not have a Patreon like some of my counterparts. No disrespect, but I don't like to ask you guys directly for money. And I also don't allow any sponsors of the show because I want to be independent to share my opinion with you without anybody putting any pressure on me. So if you would like to get some merch, here's some of the things we have to offer. We have Bourbon Real Talk lanyards. So if you check this out, if you've ever been to a bottle share before, you need to communicate with people, shake hands, do whatever, pick up another bottle, get another pour, this thing is clutch. Secondly, we have the Bourbon Real Talk official Glen glass. This is a tulip shaped glass that's going to help you nose and really enjoy the characteristics of your whiskey. Next up we have the Wee tasting glass. So this is roughly half the size of a full size glass. This is something very special because on the market there were only two sizes of this glass and we created a third because my wife Lindsay, check out episode 100, is an amazing person who can source things and make things come out of nowhere. If you ever go to a tasting and you want to be able to sample a lot of things, but you don't want to drink too much whiskey, you need one of these smaller glasses. Now, a lot of people think candles are just for women, but that's not true. Men like good smells too. And we've produced a line of masculine smelling candles for anybody out there that's interested in that. We've got leather and charcoal and tonka for you guys. Now, as you get more involved in the whiskey collecting game, you're gonna make friends and you guys are gonna trade samples and you need a beautiful solid wood storage case to keep them in because otherwise they're just gonna clutter up your shelves. We have two sizes, one for one ounce sample bottles and one for two ounce sample bottles. But if you really wanna step your whiskey game up, what you need is an American Whiskey Aroma Kit, Bourbon Real Talk Official. This has 36 separate scents inside of it that are going to help you develop your whiskey palette. You can sit down with a dram, break it down to its components, take your whiskey review level to the next step. This kit is used at two major Kentucky distilleries I can't disclose, but one of them has confirmed that they use this to train their sensory team. So if you want to take your whiskey game to the next level, you need to pick up one of these American Whiskey Aroma Kits. But if you didn't see anything that you liked here, that's fine. It's okay. We're just glad to educate you. We love to have you as a listener. But the, I, I know from experience with you that there's a lot of this that you won't drink because uh -huh. you want to save it to share with other people. What's your go-to? When you come in here and you just want to pour, is there one that you just, it's a, it's a daily drinker, it's a, you know, does it vary or is there like? I It varies, but like I drink from the bottom shelf. Right, like I, the I gettables. the gettables. I show zero hesitation to pour anything from this shelf. Right, um, that guy doesn't belong there. Oh. I don't know how he got down there, but anyway, I'll relocate him to his home later. Sure. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I'll drink from down here. Um, I also always have a bottle of Wild Turkey 101, which we use in, in the Bartesian. In the Bartesian, um, so. That bottle is downstairs and often I'll just drink Wild Turkey 101 neat because I love it and it's delicious. Um, but I, generally speaking, I don't drink anything that's above this unless there's someone here. So all of the club picks, I don't really drink those um, with one rare exception. So if you want to ask me what my daily is, um, we did this barrel pick. Um, it came out recently, like last week or two weeks ago. Um, we did a Bob Ross uh, Happy Accident Tater Sticker because we were only supposed to pick one barrel and we ended up picking two. And I had forgotten about the picks and which one I liked and whatever. And so I just bought a couple bottles of this and then when I tried it, I loved it. And I messaged the rest of the team from Summon Sea Whiskey and I was like, Oh my God, have you opened your bottle because it's freaking amazing. And everybody's like, I've opened it and you were on drugs. Uh, no one thinks it's great. And I was like, cool, more for me. And so um, I bought another case and I'm probably gonna buy another case after that. Yeah, well, you know. I didn't like it that much. I know, and you didn't like it. Like, I'm the only one that likes it. It's not it. my favorite. 
Apparently. No, yeah. I'm not the only one that likes it. It's good whiskey, but I'm saying like, to me, this is like amazing, right? right? It's, everyone else thinks like, no, it's good for what it is. For me, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. So anytime you can find a gettable bottle that you, you love that much, you should buy multiple so that, you know, you have something to go to. But yeah. The, and pick something your wife won't drink. Yeah. And then you pick something that your wife doesn't like and then boom, bonus, boom. it lasts longer. Right. Yeah. So yeah, typically Wild Turkey 101, I love 1792s. I'll actually drink because I have the Elijah Craig Barrel Proofs in the uh, 1792 Full Proofs up on the second shelf, which would indicate generally that it's hard to find or ungettable. They're not, um, I mean, some they've become harder to find. But I'll drink those sometimes because they're, they don't belong to the club, they're not club picks, and I have a ton of them. Um, it used to be Stag Jr., sadly. Mm -hmm. But as wow. you all know, Stag Jr. has gotten super hard to find. Yeah. Uh, but once it got rare, I mean, I still had access to it because my buddy in Kansas City could find it. And at one point I had 13 bottles of Stag Jr. So it was my daily drinker. And That's just sad. now I'm, I'm down to five. So I don't drink them anymore. They're just for members. So um, uh, you mentioned getting um, whiskey from Kansas City. What's the farthest a bottle has traveled to make it to the whiskey room? I think the farthest, because I do have some that are from Japan, right? And so they were distributed in Japan, um, and then they they were brought back from Japan into the U.S., and I got them in the U.S. That didn't really count because it didn't come from Japan to me. Okay. Um, I think the one that traveled the farthest is this guy. Where'd that come from? Uh, this is uh, what they call LMDW. This is Le Maison du Whiskey in Paris, France. So one of the world's largest whiskey bars. And it's also a liquor store because in, in France they have different rules. So you can have a liquor store attached to your bar. That's totally allowed. And uh, LMDW, um, they do a Blanton's Gold single barrel every year. They started doing it before it was even a thing. Um, Blanton's Gold wasn't even sold in the United States when they started doing these single uh, barrels because their bar is called the Golden Promise Bar. And so they did a Blanton's Gold, which was distributed in Europe. And uh, this one is actually kind of hard to get, but I was a very lucky club member who travels to Paris for work, offered to get me one at cost. Wow. And uh, he did, and this one is from a couple of years ago, and we still have a little bit of it left because we only let people taste this on special occasions. Yeah. So this one's probably traveled the farthest. This one came from Paris. So what's the farthest you've traveled to obtain a bottle of whiskey? Uh, that would be Atlanta. Okay. I actually took a trip to Atlanta um, with Rodney Smith, and we camped outside of a liquor store. Oh, that's right. Like you slept in the rain. We slept. In like December. In the rain in December. It was cold. One of the greatest nights of my life. And I, and I, it's so hard to describe to somebody, but like the camaraderie. Because like you went and bought a lawn chair. Yeah. So that you weren't sleeping in the water. No, no, no. no. That was the second time. See, I learned my lesson the first time. Um, so this bottle is the last of what I got on that trip in Atlanta. Uh, in Atlanta. Actually, uh, it may not be this bottle, but anyway, this is what I got. I, I, we camped out and um, we slept in the rain. There was one person that had a space heater and she was letting people use it. So she would keep her and her daughter warm. And then when they got warm enough, she'd slide it out and make an announcement and everybody would circle around. She also went back to her house, which was close by, um, because she was unable to go to the bathroom in public like the men could. Uh, there was a guy who had his truck there. It was one of the kinds of trucks that had front and doors. back doors. Yeah. And so you could open up both doors and between the two doors and the car, it kind of made like a stall, right? And it was raining so you could pee on the ground because the rain immediately washed it away. Uh, but the women did have to leave and go someplace else. So she went home, brought back a old label OWA. Everybody was sharing. 
I brought a 1792 uh, bottle and bond that was amazing. Everybody's sharing whiskey. Uh, the police showed up and he was super cool. And then he left and got off shift and came back and got in line. And it, it, it was just, I don't know, it was an amazing time. But I, I did learn some lessons from that. And the next time I got a, ret a reclining um, lawn chair, basically. Click, and click, 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 click. click. No, no, no it, it's it's it was more like a lazy boy. Like if you lean uh, back, it like popped out, and then I'm like a leg the, like thing the came out. Plastic ones that you you know. No, -uh, no. When we were kids, and uh, I was the only one that had one. I had a sleeping bag, and I was I was uh, I was sleeping. I mean, I was chilling. I had a bottle of whiskey in the bottom of my sleeping bag, and I had my little glass, and I'd like wake up, and everybody'd be talking, and then I'd give myself a little pour and take a sip of roux, and then I'd to sippy poo. Uh, no, it's sip of roux for me, sippy poo for you. And then I'd, I'd, I'd conk back out and then wake back up later. I was the only one that slept, um, got home. I was ready to party with you and the kids. Everybody else had to take a nap. It was great. Yeah. Okay, so um, most valuable bottle. What do you think is the most valuable bottle that we have? Probably Deegan's bottle. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think the one that has the most secondary market value is, is this guy, the... Um, the Johnny Fitzgerald. Um, Move your bobblehead. Yeah, Johnny Fitzgerald, uh, very special reserve. Um, Johnny Fitzgerald is a weeded whiskey and Heaven Hill bought the last of the weeded bourbon from Stitzel Weller that used to make Pappy Van Winkle. This is a 20 year. So this is basically Stitzel Weller Pappy 20 in a bottle that they they couldn't put it in that bottle because they didn't own the brand or they didn't have licensing rights so they they made this up so um bought this a few years ago and this is on the undrinkable row because yeah. i decided that i was going to keep it for our son deegan for when he's old enough to drink and everyone says he's got like seven more years on that everyone's so. like what if he doesn't want to drink it and he wants to sell it and i'm like then i'll give i'll buy it from him <laughs> we'll, drink it. we'll drink it we'll yeah. share it that's yeah. what we do okay so um most valuable and most expensive are two sometimes separate two things. separate things what what do you think is the most expensive um, bottle i'm i'm actually scared to ask because i don't know that i want to know how much we've spent on i a think bottle of whiskey. i think the most expensive bottle I have is that you've paid out of that I paid that I paid for is is this guy it's a red breast 27 year I like that one. yeah so I I think this one was I don't know, it's like 420 yeah. or 450 something like yes. that um Somewhere in that vicinity. But, I mean, look at the packaging. It's so pretty. It's so it's beautiful. It's got a little magnet. It's got magnet action. I like it. So, I think this one's the most expensive. Yeah. This one's close, though. I think I would pay two ninety for that. Yeah. Um, and then I had a bottle of um, this one's predecessor. So, this is Russell's Reserve uh, 2003. Okay. Um... I think this one was close to 300. Um, yeah, and I I had the predecessor to this, which was the 1998. And I actually bought the 1998 the same day I got the Johnny Fitzgerald. One was 280 and one was 290, and I can't remember. Uh, but but those are some of the most expensive uh, whiskeys that I've I've ever purchased. Uh, Pappy 20 was pretty expensive. I think it was 259. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, most even rare bottles of whiskey are, are, are not even 200 bucks. So. Right. Um, so is there one that has, um, a sentimental value? Like what, what's the most sentimental thing that you have on your shelf? So the most sentimental open bottle is this guy. This is a regular old Jack Daniels number seven from 1984. Four. Uh, this is before they lowered the proof from 80 or from 90 to 80 proof. Um, but this was my grandfather's bottle of whiskey. So my, my, my grandfather on my mother's side, he wasn't a big drinker. 
but um, he he would have whiskey with his eggnog at Christmas. That's the only time he really drank. And so he had this bottle for years and years. Um, and when he passed away, they found it in the closet and they were like, whiskey, that needs to go to Randy. So it came to me. <laughs> and so I, I have that guy. Um, and I will let people try it. It's, you know, it's not a museum piece. It's, it's open. Uh, it does taste a little dusty. Uh, the, my most prized possession that is unopened is this guy. And I did some research on it. I think it's 1963 or four. Um, but this was also from my grandfather's closet. Uh, this is antique. When I did the research, uh, I, all of you know this whiskey you just don't know that you know it so you know the the memes of the real manly boxer with the curled oh, mustache yeah. and he's like it's black and white and he's you know mm -hmm. always standing like this his name was john o'sullivan and he was the spokesperson for antique whiskey and some of the pictures of him on google if you google search him images it says antique on his mm. his, his boxing box. trunks yeah. but i think this is from 1963 or 1964 um, and I believe that this was made at the distillery that's currently Four Roses, if I remember correctly. Uh, but um, neat bottle. Don't know that I'll ever open that one just because, you know, I'm sure the whiskey's not amazing, but it's more valuable to me as the, yeah. you know, history of my grandfather. It's granddad's. Yeah. Um, so is that your oldest bottle? 63? What's your oldest bottle? Well, that's a tricky question um, because... Um, Barreled age? No, no. It's tricky because they're not here yet, but I... What did you do? I bought some bottles of Four Roses from between 1924 and 19... Or 1929 and 1944. Somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, so... It can't be 1929 because they weren't in production during Prohibition, but somewhere in that era, the, there's a patent uh, that was registered in 1929 that's associated with two of these models. So those will be the oldest ones that I own when they get here. Uh, we are donating one to Four Roses um, for their collection. Uh, or Brent Elliott, if he just wants to drink it. I don't care. I'm giving it to Brent. He can do with it what he wants. Um, but the oldest bottle that we have is this guy um, that's in-house. This is Jim Beam from 1953, distilled and bottled in 1959. So this was released as a six-year age-dated product. And for some strange reason, it has marijuana leaves all over it. <laughs> I have no idea why. Um, I've, I've told people that I have a Jim Beam decanter that has a marijuana leaf on it and they don't believe me and then they see it and they're like, what in the hell? How did this happen? Um, but yeah, this is 1959 distilled in 53. So this is the oldest that we have in house. Now, that haven't been said, it's not the oldest whiskey that I have because I have samples. Oh. Um, and... If you are a regular viewer of the podcast, you know that we we sell these boxes. storage boxes, and I do have a in in my personal storage box. I have an Overholt Rye from 1909. That is the oldest whiskey that I have in the house, and I have tasted it. I won it in a charity auction and a raffle, and it was a two ounce sample but it got passed through a lot of people's hands before it made it to me. And when I got it, there was about a half ounce missing. Uh, and I, it, I was afraid because of its age that it could degrade. Um, and so I transferred it to a one ounce, but it left me with like a half ounce of the whiskey. And there was a club member here the day I did it. So he and I both had a quarter ounce of it and it actually still tastes good. Uh, but in 1909, there, there were no manufacturing regulations and so who knows, they could have been adding sugar and all kinds of good stuff to it to make it taste good. But it held up well over time, so. Favorite whiskey? If you can pick one of the babies. 
Oh, man, that's tough. I, when people ask, I always say George C. Stagg. Um, so I have, I have two George C. Staggs right now. I've got this one, which is George C. Stagg uh, 2020. Okay. And this one, which is uh, 2017. And when people ask, I tell them that 2017 is my favorite whiskey of all time. Because um, people ask. And uh, what I found is that I, I enjoy a whiskey based on the experience that I had when I drank it, less so just based on its flavor. Um, but this is interesting because I've had these two bottles for a long time, but I never noticed how different they were in color until I put them beside one another yeah. on a lit shelf, right? Um, and if you were to ask me, I would assume I'd like the darker one more, but I do like the lighter one more. Hmm. And so... Um, these are some of my favorites, but as you can see uh, on the shelf, they are right next to Prideful Goat and Unallocated, um, which, you know, the Prideful Goat is a brand that I helped create with Christopher Hart um, in conjunction with uh, Gulf Coast Distillery. It's, it, it's so near and dear to my heart that it, it holds space in the center on the top shelf uh, along with uh, the other brand I helped create with um, some people from uh, the club that I run, Someone See Whiskey, which is unallocated. So, but uh, I think that pretty much covers the whiskey wall. The whiskey wall. And what's what's coming up. Yeah. So if this is your first time watching, just want to thank you for tuning in. If you want more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can get that at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, and Instagram and Facebook forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. But I want to take a second to tell you about the channel philosophy. And it basically comes down to the fact that brown spirits have a tendency to bring people together. It's a, it's, it's a product that is somehow viewed in our, you know, collective lizard brain as a communal resource. It's not something that you just sit down and you drink a whole bottle of whiskey by yourself. It's meant to be shared. And because I recognize its connective power, I was trying to find a way to help bring people together and help people that maybe would feel like they were on the outside, that they were connected to other people. And the reason why I was trying to do that was because sadly, I lost my younger brother to suicide in 2014. And it was shocking to us because, you know, we knew he had problems, but we just, we didn't know how bad off he really was. And it made me realize that there could be people all around us, around you, that they, they don't feel loved. They don't feel connected. And I wanted to use the connective power of whiskey to help any of you out there feel connected and understand that you're part of a community and that you are loved and cared about. And so that's part of the reason why I started this podcast. And it's also the reason why I sign every episode off the same way. And that is this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that we, we love, love you. you. And we'll see you next time. I'm Bourbon Real Talk. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's generally, I just stand here while I... What, what? <laughs> so are you gonna pour something? Yeah, bro. Before we start? Yeah. What do you think? A drink, that's what I do. And I know thanks. Drinking I know thanks. Drinking I know thanks. <laughs>